Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first of the workshop series for the 15K Creative Arts Competition. My name is Shannon Rose McAuliffe, and I am joined here with my colleague, Theo Fields. Say hello, Theo. Hello. <laughs> um, we're here this evening, and we're going to be discussing value propositions with Dr. Michael Camp from The Ohio State University. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Camp, do a quick introduction, and then we're off. Great. Well, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Theo. It's good to be with you. I appreciate that. All the way from Columbus, Ohio. As I was sharing earlier, it's uh, just a little over 50 degrees today, but it was very cold yesterday. So glad to be inside, glad to be on Zoom. Very excited to be able to share with you tonight. Uh, let me go ahead and share a screen and uh, we'll get the presentation started. Okay, yeah, just in the way of a brief introduction, I'll leave a lot of what's on the slide in case uh, you're going to be uh, delivering the slides uh, in intact at a later point in time. Uh, for the most part, just wanted to summarize, you know, I'm currently at The Ohio State University and have been there since 2004. However, I actually finished my doctorate work there uh, back in the 90s. And so I've uh, been associated with The Ohio State University for quite some time. I've taught at the Fisher College of Business. I'm now in the College of Engineering. I've actually run almost all of the various interdisciplinary hybrid experiential educational programs in innovation and entrepreneurship. Some of them are now on their own and I'm not involved with them any longer. Uh, the Langdale Tech Academy and a variety of others. I'm currently mostly responsible for the i Ohio program, which trains research scientists and graduate students in the advanced principles of technology entrepreneurship. And I'm working on some undergraduate programming within the Center for Design and Manufacturing Excellence on innovation and technology. Entrepreneurship, there's not a big focus. Is, if you can believe that, with such a big school, there's not a big focus from the undergraduates in the engineering program on entrepreneurship. So we thought we better course correct there pretty quickly. So anyway, uh, there's more detail there on the slide for you. You know, it was interesting when I got asked to share with you this evening, I, I was a bit, uh, a, I guess the best word is perplexed because of the notion of what I understand art entrepreneurship to be and what the general theme of entrepreneurship is. And I thought what might be a great way to start so that we make sure we're all on the same page is just to start with what I found to be a pretty interesting definition of entrepreneurship. You know, the field of entrepreneurship has been around since the 70s for the most part as an academic discipline. And to a large extent, the definitions that we use in terms of researching it and understanding what we mean by the word entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial behavior uh, really has never taken root. There's a lot of disagreement among the scholars and there's a lot of effort to make the word relate to whatever might is best usefulness for the, the academic programs that you're pursuing. I found this particular definition, it's very consistent with mine, though it's got one small variation, but this was from James Hart, and I liked it because he's from the School of Art at, at SMU. He says that entrepreneurship, the creation of opportunity and value with intent to profit in a variety of ways through the assumption of risk and effort. And one of the few examples that, like me, actually focuses on the assumption of risk. And when I was asked to speak on value proposition, this is a really tough topic to speak on. And I'll share as we go through here in just a few minutes why, uh, why it is very challenging. But for the most part, it's because it's at the center of what entrepreneurship means. The notion of both creating and capturing value and also at the same time executing your, you know, the discipline and the mechanics of actually running a business in order to capture that value. These are the, the critical components that are very challenging to actually identify, they're very challenging to evaluate, and they're very challenging to execute. And so for me, this is the bread and butter of all entrepreneurship, regardless of art entrepreneurship or otherwise. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to, if you'll give me the permission, I'm going to just uh, venture off here for just a second to talk about what I think of when I think of arts entrepreneurship. If you take the definition we just identified, there's really three ways I can slice it. And I look at the entrepreneurial effort as the enterprise in the arts industry as one component, that is establishing the means by which we buy and sell art or artistic expression. And I would think of examples like Shutterfly. 
I know the competition you're in now is a strong focus on the role that technology plays in advancing uh, both the creation and distribution and trade of art itself. I think this is one particular context that makes an interesting or would provide an interesting perspective in terms of what we're thinking about. I'm sure several of your teams are actually focusing on arts entrepreneurship in this regard, the means of buying and selling and using technology to exploit that. However, there's also the notion of enterprise for the arts. And I thought it was a nice example of Michelangelo with the Sistine Chapel. Uh, you probably know well, he was actually paid to do that. In fact, had to be bribed significantly in order to leave a job he already had that he was being paid for in order to take on the job and was paid what was at the time pretty handsomely, but took four years to create. So we'll talk a little bit in a moment about the notion of value creation and how time, investment, costs, opportunity all come into play and have to be considered in terms of our venture opportunities as to whether the value we're actually creating, the value proposition which we're developing within our enterprises are really worth the opportunity or worth the effort. And thirdly, the notion of enterprise as art. This is using our creative expression to create sustainable and long lasting solutions. For me, this is the essence of what I do in entrepreneurship. I, de I never would have called it arts entrepreneurship, or I don't call it arts entrepreneurship. But for me, the art is actually in the design and creation of the underlying business model enterprise and how you can solve unique and challenging problems in the world through the power of enterprise. And I believe just like a canvas of an artist, my business model is a canvas by which I can create and make lasting impact and significant meaning through the work that I do. And so for me, I've had opportunities to develop thousands of artistic expressions as enterprise, as art itself. And I thought this was just a nice way to characterize depending on where the teams are coming from. I wouldn't have any idea. I haven't read any of your original idea pitches and I probably won't be there at the end to see those pitches uh, at the end of the, the final program. So just wanted to share that with you as a way of contextualizing what we're talking about. You know, it, for me, I also am fairly simplistic. I like to break down the concepts of something like value proposition. So once again, to make sure we're all on the same page. So while we have multiple contexts in which to think about how we create value through our enterprising initiatives, what is it that we're really creating when we talk about a value proposition? And simply put, the notion of value is the importance, worth, or usefulness of whatever the target focus is, whatever the thing is we're talking about. The proposition is a notion of a statement that expresses that concept and can be true or false. And when I mentioned earlier the notion of risk, therein lies the essence of risk in terms of how we create value. In this instance, our value propositions, the proposals, if you will, the propositions we're making regarding how our new enterprises are going to create value are actually statements that express the concept at, the, at, at its essence, but also can be true or false. And that's the critical distinction. What we want to talk about this evening is regardless of context in terms of how you're using your creative expression to drive value through your enterprising initiatives, the key here is that the basis on which you determine what the value proposition is, is either true or false. And essentially that's what it comes down to. You know, the fundamentals of value proposition though, I wish we had time. I literally teach an entire month of a two and a half month course on just this concept. Uh, typically we're working with high technology businesses. However, much of that technology embeds the creative expression of the research scientists who have developed those inventions. And so there's a strong creative expression that's actually undergirding all of the initiatives that we do. And in understanding the value of the proposition, you have to ask yourself these key considerations or the key fundamental questions. In other words, the risk is, if you go back to the definition earlier, the notion of the effort, the risk associated, this question is, is it feasible? It's one thing to have invented something in a lab or to be tinkering with something at home and identify a unique way to manipulate technology to create different outcomes. 
The question, however, in value proposition is, can we really create sustainable value? What is the value creating potential of what we've developed or what we've discovered? Is it feasible? And that's determined by, based on the notion of time and cost associated with its achievement. Again, we can't simply stop with that first initial discovery. We have to understand that if value is gonna be created, it's gonna be solving problems. And if so, it's gotta be introduced into the marketplace. And so the notion of the risk or the time and cost associated with making it feasible has to be taken into consideration when we're thinking of value proposition. It's also the notion of value itself, you know, go figure. Uh, but th in this case, the question is, is it different? In other words, does it create new value, net new value? And that value is created by the degree to which the solution addresses the core parameters of the problem. And you may say resolves the problem or resolves the core components of the problem, perhaps not all the components. You can imagine a number of solutions, uh, artistic or not, that solve some portion of a particular problem, but only address a particular piece. And that needs other solutions in order to derive the total resolution. And the third and final is, is it necessary? In other words, is it necessary means, is it likely to be adopted or utilized and deployed? And will there be an opportunity for this notion of what we call the trade, the transaction activity, where we capture the value that we embed or create within our products and services solutions? And that is represented in the buy and sell transaction activity that happens around those new products and services that we introduce. So think of your idea. Think of the creative idea you're considering now as part of this competition. Is it feasible? How is it different if it's different? And why is it necessary? And you'll find that these are critical questions that if you can answer, not only increase your confidence in the enterprising initiative you're trying to undergird uh, with the art, art, uh, art expression, you'll also find that it's the essential element to build your confidence to move forward. And those are the key considerations in whether or not you ever do start this venture you're, you're playing with at this time. You know, th this is an interesting quote in the process of trying to find this illustration to drive home the point about the different contexts. I came across a quote from Michelangelo. And I, I thought it was intriguing. That, you know, if you knew how much work went into it, you would not call it genius. Now, if any of you are art majors or art art students or art professionals, you probably have come across this, it might not mean much to you. But in the context of value proposition and value creation, this is a very interesting quote to decipher. Again, we won't spend much time with it, but think about what that means with respect to the notion of the, the overall art that was created, the effort that had to go in to create this art. And yes, by the way, as I mentioned, he was paid and was paid well, uh, according to the times. Um, but what about the trade, the buy-sell concept? Was it worth it? Do you believe there was value captured? Now we look at this piece of art today and we see the intrinsic value. I mean, it moves your soul or should, or perhaps, or that was the intent. Um, but does it ultimately have extrinsic value and would it have been perceived as such at the time when i start to translate some of these concepts into the type of ventures that i start or help to start on a regular basis whether it be through my students or the research scientists that we're training or some of the consulting activities just like artists use a canvas we use what we call the business model canvas and this is a a very simple rendering of what the business model canvas is and and like most of these types of illustrations they really aren't in and of themselves of any uh, particular insight or value the importance of this canvas is it's simply a way of organizing your information ultimately in order to articulate a clear and compelling value proposition you have to be able to show how it embeds within an overarching business model. It's not enough to just simply describe a value proposition. In fact, it's, it's not possible um, in and of itself. If you see how the value proposition is 
position within this canvas, it's directly in the center. And immediately to the right is the customer segments and all the ways in which the value proposition serves the needs of those customer segments. Again, depending on you know, the nature of that segment and the nature of the product service offering, there's a variety of ways in which value proposition serves it. But if you look immediately to the left, these are all the ways in which we create the value proposition that solves and serves the needs of the customer segments. Those value creating competencies around key activities, key resources, and key partnerships are the critical backbone of the notion of value proposition. So it's not enough to have a compelling value proposition. It's only compelling to the extent we believe you can deliver. And the only way we can believe you can deliver if you clearly understand what the key activities are that you're going to need to master in order to deliver that value proposition and what key resources you're going to have to have in order to sustain that and where you don't have those key resources what key partnerships are you going to have to build into your overarching model in order to deliver that value ultimately to drive solutions to your customers that are better than alternative competitive solutions on the market now so this is really an organizing framework but for me from an artistic standpoint i envision it as a very powerful and compelling uh, canvas by which we can uh, or lump of clay by which we can sculpt uh, a compelling business model. And it might sound like a play on words, but I actually do consider myself to be fairly arts oriented. I come from a family of that sort. And I'm actually personality wise, much of a designer builder type. And I'm constantly, whether I'm building educational programs or building startup opportunities, uh, new ventures, um, there's always a design and a creative articulation that uh, is embedded in all of that work. What we're driving for here in a clear, compelling sense is this notion of fit. We want to understand clearly how our solution fits the needs or solves the problems in a compelling way with the customer segments. And I'm going to come back to this at least one other time, if not more, and we'll explain there's actually more to that story, but we have to develop our thoughts here for just a moment. When you get this deck, uh, this will be a slide that you can use as a reference slide. I'm not going to pour over this slide. This was actually from an article I used in the MBA class. I thought it was nicely summarized uh, as a way to consider what a value proposition is, what it consists of, and uh, what challenges it addresses for the customer, what is required in order for it to be compelling, and what are some of the challenges and risks associated with it. And then you see how that plays out across the different columns. What I'd like you to, what I would like to point out and what I hope you'll discern when you spend a little bit of time with this is the notion of value propositions, direct link and tie and consideration of the customer and the customer segment. And it's not enough to simply know who your customer is. And while this is a nice additional, uh, a nice uh, summary resource to use, it falls short in what I believe to be a critical component. But once you know that component and you read this chart through that lens, you'll have a much more, uh, a deep and comprehensive perspective of what these terms mean and how relevant they are. And we're going to talk about that perspective in a moment. Uh, before we jump to that, are there any questions at all about what we mean by value proposition and what we mean by the context of value proposition creation in arts and arts entrepreneurship? If people have questions, they can either unmute to ask Dr. Camp or we can, you know, I will happily receive those through the chat. Okay. Looks like everything is smooth sailing so far, so I will just let you continue. <laughs> Very good. I think it was, would be fun to just talk about uh, a good illustration. I'm sorry I don't have a better one at the moment to match up with uh, the arts competition that you're going to. As I've said already, though, I do believe that there's enormous creative expression, enormous use of technology in a lot of product markets that I spend time. I, my work cr has crossed over 36 different technology verticals from the medical 
to the uh, software to uh, materials and ag related bioproducts. And so I, I don't have a problem transitioning or perhaps the better word is translating these concepts from one segment to the next. And, and yet I see this as an enormous uh, expression of, of uh, or an illustration that expresses the enormous potential in the role of value creation. If you look at the notion of the Keurig cold, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Keurig cold, and I wish I could see you so you could raise your hand, but uh, it's not that important. The critical consideration is you're probably all familiar with the Keurig hot. Well, before there was a Keurig hot, there was just Keurig, and the Keurig hot came to be because of the Keurig cold, and the notion of having to differentiate how you get a hot beverage versus you get a cold beverage. And this was a partnership that was launched with Keurig uh, in partnership with Coca-Cola to develop the same type of K-cup type um, technology that would deliver a cold carbonated beverage as opposed to a hot beverage. And um, I just wondered if anybody was familiar with that. Very, very interesting, very, very exciting technology. Actually, a beautiful design. Again, in my opinion, extremely artistic, extremely well laid out. There are over 150 issued patents inside of the Keurig Cole that was developed along the way. However, so at the bottom line, there's really fundamentally nothing wrong with this concept in its technical sense. Fundamentally, it, it can perform if we knew that it was feasible at work. Uh, this is actually an illustration taken actually directly from one of those patents, the patent around how to carbonate, carbon, um, put the carbon dioxide directly into the solution in order to make the carbonated beverage. Uh, all of those little individual pieces are actually identified in the patent. So a very interesting piece of technology, but one of the most disastrous new product innovations of all time. I mean, ranks up there as a classic, even if you haven't heard of Keurig Cold, if you understand the facts behind this case, you know exactly how, how disastrous this was. It was pulled off the market in less than nine months, uh, about six years, just shy of six years and $1 billion went into the research and development of the product. It was taken off the market less than one year after the company had already been acquired. So even in the acquisition of the company, the process of due diligence, this product would have been evaluated. And so even the acquirers would have not known that this was going to be as disastrous at the time they acquired it. But more importantly, 135 employees in the state of Vermont lost their job. And that's pretty unfortunate. And I would ask, so what went wrong? Well, we could probably identify just brainstorming a, a half a dozen different concepts. I could tell you that the cost of each individual eight ounce glass of carbonated beverage was about $1.32. Um, the, the machine is about twice as big as a Keurig hot, so it literally takes up a third of your counter, kitchen counter. Uh, it's also extremely heavy, and there were very few K-cups that were actually available at the time. There were several Coca-Cola products, but that was about it, and a few other, but that was about it. But the bottom line is there really was no problem solution fit. In other words, if you would asked any of these engineers, you, you can bet they had a very strong value proposition. They were convinced, even Keurig and Coca-Cola, two of the top consumer beverage brands in the world who have millions of customers and could gone to any number of those customers to get a clear, compelling sense of whether or not this product solved any problem or not. And they didn't. And if they did, they were biased in their approach because it didn't show any evidence that no one would want to buy it. Oh, and by the way, the machine was about $650 when it first came out. So about twice as expensive as the Curie Hot when it first came out, and even more so by the time it was widely adopted. So let's not get into any confusion that any one of these elements is what was the downfall. The reality is they were building a product nobody wanted. And this is a critical consideration. And I know you're only at the idea stage of your, your arts entrepreneurship competition, but I will tell you that it's at that stage where all startups begin. And the need for or intention to go beyond that must be driven by your clear understanding of the problem and solution fit. You remember 
The value proposition, again, is this importance or worth or usefulness of something. Let's take the Keurig code. Its importance um, was dependent on some key considerations, and those statements of importance were either true or false. And the best time to determine the validity of those statements is now, today. During the idea stage is the time in which you not only create the value proposition, you validate and confirm the value proposition along the way. We have this precept in all of our teaching. That's a, a nice quote. I use quotes for all of my precepts, but it's from Mark Twain that it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So the reality of testing the value proposition of your business is not that this value proposition lives in some obscure reality that somehow you know, we've, we've been enlightened in terms of the needs of our market and we know exactly what the customer wants. The reality is that's all driven by the assumptions we're making, which are driven by our own biases and our own ignorances and the own uh, lack of understanding of re what really happens. I can point you to dozens of teams that were convinced that they were gonna solve a particular problem only to get testing into the market and find out that the problem didn't really exist or the solution was way over complicated for the no notion of the problem. So it's important that we understand and think about those carefully. Let's look at this situation that has a near zero probability of being correct. This is a new venture idea that was based on the following assumptions. You would probably recognize it right away. First assumption is that there are too few affordable hotels in the city for short-term stays. People are probably willing to pay for alternative options if the hotels are not available. People are probably willing to compromise on some of those original amenities in order just to save money. Uh, there's probably enough people that would be willing to do this that I could make a profit. Other people might even be willing to rent one or more bedrooms in their apartments. And there are probably enough people willing to subrent their apartments that we might be able to establish a sustainable service. Well, it's no, it's not hard to guess, Airbnb. But, and you know that that's a pretty wild success. However, if we were, if you understand how Airbnb actually was created, you'll realize that each one of these individual steps were tested, actually live tested with customers in the market before they ever wrote a business plan, before they ever took out a bank loan, before they ever decided to find partners, they literally just talked to their friends and made their rooms available and their extra rooms in their apartments, put a small website together and then added more rooms. And by the time they ever wrote what might be considered a business plan, they were already multi-million dollar business and already had actually achieved other, uh, other successes as well. So, but don't fret about the Keurig cold, rest assured, Keurig has figured out all of its problems and what went wrong. And they've now introduced Drinkworks Home Bar. So although the Keurig cold was a colossal failure, Keurig is 100% convinced that Drinkwork Home Bar, a single serve pod-based premium cocktail spritzer machine is exactly what we all want. And this is gonna go rolling off the shelves just anytime soon. These are, yes, K-cups that create al carbonated alcoholic mixed beverages. And that's it, they figured it out. Uh, yeah, sure, <laughs> we'll see. However, let's, let's bring all of this back a little closer to home and looking at what we're dealing with. Another near zero probability of being correct set of assumptions are exactly where you are right now. And in this instance, with respect to how your new venture will create value or capture value, you're making some core assumptions, at least all the teams that I've coached up through this point of 25 years of doing this typically make these assumptions going in. It's why they decided to enter the competition in the first place. There's a level of confidence in the assumptions you're making about your new venture idea. You're assuming that the customer you're focused on has the problem you're focused on and knows that they have the problem, let's hope, that they've tried alternative solutions and nothing's worked uh, up to this point. They can articulate what they need. That's a really big assumption. 
and they know how valuable uh, an alternative solution would be if it solved that problem. And you're probably already making assumptions regarding how much they might be willing to pay for such a solution. At the same time, which is the second side, the risk side associated, or actually on the buy sell side of associated with value proposition, we're assuming that the solution we can make addresses those pain points and performs better than anything already in the market. And it doesn't require any significant change in the current workflow and doesn't increase the cost of adopting our product over alternatives and we can sell it for X in order to sustain the operations and make a profit for our new venture. Some of you could give your final pitch right now. Some of you, based on these assumptions, could today write a business plan and pitch for funding. It happens all the time. But remember that the key to a strong value proposition, the key is the evidence to determine if it's true. The evidence that is true is what establishes your value proposition. And remember that the value proposition is the essential uh, ingredient to your entire business model. Without a compelling value proposition that you can prove is true, you really have left in question the entire business concept. Even though you may have a lot of other aspects completed until this is fully articulated, there's really not much else to be believed. There's very little confidence. We have a saying in the i training program in Ohio. It's, a, as I said, a, a graduate student and research scientist-led entrepreneurship initiative, training initiative, that we don't care what you think. We, we're not really even interested in what you believe. The only thing that matters is what you can prove. And that's where value proposition comes in. So uh, we're moving into the last segment of our, our few minutes together. Are there any questions about any of those illustrations and the importance of understanding our customer segments and, and why that level of understanding and depth of clarity is necessary in order to generate a, a good compelling value proposition? So far, everything seems pretty clear to me and I am just desperate to see how that uh, cocktail curing thing works out. <laughs> well, I, I stopped short of telling you that I had bought one of those cured colds. Um, however, I bought it after I knew that it was being pulled off the market uh, because I wanted to use it as a good example. Uh, if we were in class this evening, I would have it sitting behind me and you'd get a chance to at least try that. Um, but I intend to get one of these too, particularly if it goes off the market, but either way, <laughs> I intend to get one of these too. Excellent. I will so, look forward to a full report. Very good. Very good. Well, we're moving now into a bit granular uh, approach to actually understanding, you know, how do we evaluate the customer and the customer profile and what we're doing? And again, I have an entire 12 week semester with, uh, with finals and presentations and everything around just this concept alone. And this is at the center of the i program. So we're gonna get a few minutes. And I apologize, we can't go deeper. I'm happy to answer any questions in the future or our future iterations or if there's, you wanna email me, I'll make my email available. So happy to be helpful, but we're gonna really cover it superficially. So please ask questions if I either go too quickly or too, uh, too superficially. So. The notion of the business model canvas, as we showed a little bit ago, and I mentioned to you that the, the key here is clarifying this value proposition and its link or fit with the customer profile and the pains and problems the customer is having in achieving the jobs they're intending to achieve. Well, there's the same group that developed that, that canvas map, that business model canvas developed this value proposition canvas. And if you have familiarity with it, I'm not going to go into a deep dive in terms of the dynamics of how the mapping works, but I'm going to talk a little bit about each of the individual pieces. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to bore someone who maybe uses this in a number of classes, and I, or you're using it now in the, in the program, <clears throat> or I didn't want to be too uh, loose with, uh, with any of these individual pieces because you maybe already covered it. But this is, all this is is just a breakout of those two segments. But we're, we, we break them out because it takes my teams anyway, four out of eight weeks when we run the eight week i program, it's at least four weeks before the teams can articulate to my satisfaction 
and I'll explain what I mean by that, before they can articulate clearly how the value proposition they create through the products and services they offer derive, drive directly value created into the customer for the jobs he or she's trying to perform. And it, I let, literally get them down to that level of clarity. And when I say customers here, I'm not talking about, in this case, just like the automotive market or the arts industry or the theater program. I'm literally talking about who, what job by job title would be the user, payer, influencer of the purchase of my product or services I'm addressing. If, if you can't articulate that, you leave a big question in my mind as to whether you really know whether you create any value or not or solve any legitimate problem or not. So these are not abstract concepts. These are literally down to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. We're literally talking face-to-face, -face, in this case, zoom to zoom, if you will. Uh, we're talking directly with our customers. Well, let's talk for a moment about the notion of the customer profile. This is where you wanna start your customer discovery activities, trying to identify, do I have a compelling value proposition or not? Do I, can, is it feasible? Is it different? And is it valuable? Does it matter? Um, it, you know, why should it exist? These are critical considerations. The first thing you have to understand is you have to explain who do I assume is going to use my product? And then who do I assume if my user doesn't buy, who's going to buy my product so my customer can use it? And then if my buyer doesn't actually use it or can't influence the decision, who influences the decision so that my buyer can buy it so that my customer can use it? And sometimes our our concepts are you know, business to consumer, they're direct, they're websites, and these are not complicated matters. Other times they're medical devices and there's 14 levels of decision maker you have to go through in order to get them approved. So I'm not sure where anybody is at any time, but I can tell you for sure, if you can't articulate it back to me in, simplicit, in, in a simple way and an effective and compelling way, I'm not gonna believe you know it either, and that's the key, what we're talking about today. So in this instance, these are the set of customer characteristics that in the most important word is there that you can validate with actual customers in the market. The first thing you need to understand are the customer jobs. And that literally is just asking the customer that I think has the problem that would use my product, what is his or her job? What is it they do? They're a design engineer at an automotive manufacturing facility. Okay, what do they do? Okay, they design parts, they, de they design systems, they write software. They meet schedules. But then I ask the pains and gains. What I want to know there is, well, what challenges, what are the difficulties they have at getting that job done? Oh, their software is too archaic. They have too many different softwares that don't link with each other. Uh, it takes too long. It's too much done by committee. There's no other design graphic software that would make it more effective, you know, whatever it might be. And then the other is the gains. What are the things they would like to achieve but can't because they lack the adequate opportunity or resource? the adequate product or solution that you might provide. Maybe they would like to be able to save time in the designs or share the designs with more of the different designers across their company in order to get things facilitated more efficiently or more effectively. So a host of those things, maybe not the best example, but you, you need to understand your customer at a detailed level in terms of what job are they trying to create and what challenges and gains are they trying to achieve with that job. And on the value proposition side, the notion here is that do we have a set of characteristics that actually allow the customer to achieve those gains or resolve those pains associated with their jobs? And remember, ultimately, though, we have to be able to do this better than the current alternative products. Whatever the customer, if these are real problems the customer's trying to solve, he or she would have already been looking for alternative solutions. In fact, they may have already been testing and paying for solutions that they're not happy with, and maybe even adopting them and using them because there's nothing else available. Your best customer, the best person to understand what they need is someone that's already looking for solutions, better yet has already paid for alternative solutions that they're not happy with. Now you're not solving the original problem, you're solving the problem that they're having with the alternative solutions that don't work well enough. All of a sudden now you've shifted the priority and a higher level of interest in your product if it can resolve those types of issues. So ultimately we're bringing all of that together. So when we've captured that information, we can put it on a graphic, something like this, that says, well, how do the pain relievers 
um, our pain alleviators associated with our products and services actually relieve the pains of our customers in order to allow them to do their job better. Or better yet, how do the, the benefits of our solutions actually drive new and improved scenarios so that the customer can either do more or do, do more with less? And so it requires two things, a clear understanding of the jobs and the pains and gains of the customer, and then an evaluation of how your product actually matches or solves or fits the word fit in order to solve those pains and gains. And that's what we mean by the notion of problem solution fit. And this is why Keurig didn't work, uh, or the Keurig code anyway, why it didn't work. I couldn't point, pinpoint exactly, but I could tell you just my own experience. I used a Keurig for years and I would have, could have told you immediately that the code made no sense to me and I would not be interested in it. So as we wrap up here, you know, after many weeks of this particular program, you're going to be in for weeks and weeks in these training workshops and the research on your efforts and all the mentoring that you're going to be getting. I found it interesting if nothing's changed in the priorities or, or the parameters of the competition, you're going to get five minutes to tell your story. Multiple weeks of training, research and mentoring, and you're going to get five minutes to tell your story. Now, the last thing you want to do is try to fit all your information into that five minutes. So you, I, I ask you, what is the storyline? What is the compelling and convincing storyline that you have to tell in order to achieve a victory in a five minute presentation? Now, you might be thinking, I'm going to say it's the value proposition. And I would tell you, it's not enough. <laughs> It is the value proposition in terms of its key role, but stay with me for one more second. We have to understand the customer. You only needed an idea to get into the competition program, but to win, you're gonna to have to leave your idea, leave it on the desktop and get out of the building as commonly referred to virtually if necessary and talk directly to your customers. Your business model why who, who is your customer first of all well your evolving business model is by its in nature a value creation engine therefore everyone your business touches customers suppliers end users payers purchasers whatever however it's delineated across from start to finish on the decision to buy your product instead of one of your competitors those are your customers and if you need a partner in order to deliver a unique uh, feature inside of a software, they are part of your customer. In other words, anyone who derives value from participating with you in your business proposition is a customer. Remember, you're doing this in order to create and capture value. There's many reasons why, some to sustain your enterprise, but others to change the world and make a meaningful impact and sustain that change so it can impact people for years to come whatever it might be, as a value creation engine, think of your enterprises in that way. Anybody who derives or contributes becomes a customer in your customer discovery process. And here are the keys. You gotta acknowledge the critical assumptions that undergird why you think this is going to be a successful business. And that means come clean, get in a room with your team, Zoom room if it has to be, get in a room, and come clean on everything you're assuming to be true. In other words, ask yourself, what has to be true for this to be real? And then you're gonna document those and then go out and empirically test those directly with your potential customers. You need to be able to articulate with evidence what problems they are trying to solve. Not what problem you think they have, but what problems are they trying to solve? What alternative solutions have they tried? Where, and what value does your technology create if it solves the problem better? Your focus must be on understanding their past and current behaviors, not opinions. It doesn't matter if I said, you know, if I had a product of this sort, would you buy one? And they said, oh, sure. It's, it's a useless state. It's not even meaningful. Ask them, what was the last product they bought to try to solve this? How did that work out? Were they happy with the decision? What didn't work out? What, what are they looking for now? And what would they pay for a solution that did? That is 
the no, or what did they pay for the solution that didn't work out? That is the notion of what they perceive to be valuable or not. That's data you can trust. Their past behavior is the key to proving the value in your proposed product or service. And then again, wrapping up, as we've said, the value proposition, your ability to prove that value proposition is the essential element of how your whole business model holds together. And remember, five minutes, just five minutes, you've got to get this across. In other words, you've got to contract your space. You've got to bring the message in. You've got to be very simple. But in that simple message, it's got to be clear and it's got to be compelling in order for you to win. Okay, spoiler alert. I know who the winner is this year. I'm sorry, Shannon and Theo. I hate to you know, let the cat out of the bag, but the winner this year is the team that can prove the problem's real, the market's large, the team can deliver, and the solution ensures a strong and competitive fit with customer needs. In other words, can prove. You'll hear a lot of presentations at the end of this program where the team's still speculating. They think, they believe, they're confident. The team that can prove with evidence directly from customers that their value proposition is real is going to heads and shoulders above the others. And it's very clear in a five minute presentation which ones are able to achieve that. Well, I'm open. I think that was it. Yeah, let All the games right. begin. Let the games begin. Oh, fabulous. Do you mind if I pop this back in a gallery view so we're sort of, you know, able to converse a bit? Absolutely. All hope, right. I hope there's a lot of open conversation. All right. So. Does anybody have any initial questions, thoughts? It would also be great to see some people on camera. I am familiar with some of you, but not all of you. So it would be nice to sort of see who's in the room and see what kind of conversation we can get going in the next few minutes. Don't while, be shy. While, pe while people are thinking, Shannon, I have to ask, I hate to admit, I don't know what that is behind you. What is your oh, graphic? Okay, this That's is... So this is King's College Chapel in Cambridge over in the UK. Uh, probably my favorite place that I've ever sung because the acoustics on those fan vault ceilings are unparalleled. I've never sung anywhere in the States. Maybe the Cathedral of St. John the Divine because it's just so huge, but any of the places where I've done nice singing, um, this, is, this takes the cake. That is awesome. All right. All right. Well, um, for the benefit of people who are watching this asynchronously, I think uh, one question in order to uh, to avoid being a Keurig and kind of continuing to kind of bark up a tree that maybe doesn't have value, how should teams think about potentially changing their their big why or their value prop? What's the best strategies for doing that? And how can you do that effectively uh, while still kind of preserving your initial mission? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, and just to be as simple about it, I didn't discuss the notion of uh, a term we refer to lean startup. Again, it might be a common term your teams or students have used, but the notion of, of this customer discovery activity is because we're trying to go fast. In other words, we, we want to get to the nose. We know there's a lot of the assumptions we're making that aren't real or aren't true. And in the process of doing it effectively and doing it deliberately, we're going to uncover where those gaps are. So trust me, you're, all of your ideas are going to pivot. They're all going to modify either slightly or greatly. But the, how we do that is in the actually derived from the discovery process itself. I don't want you to think that this is, I'm going to go talk to a bunch of customers and realize my business is dead in the water. There's no, nobody needs what I have. What am I going to do now? It's actually in the discovery process by really being honest with yourself, not trying to simply validate that you have the greatest solution in the world, but really understanding their problems and understanding how they look for alternative solutions now and what they're willing to pay for those solutions where the next idea will emerge. I tell my teams all the time, the last thing you want to do is, is uh, go in with, I've got a one-step solution. If you don't want it, you must not be smart enough to know you need it or you know, I, I, I'm out of business, that, neither of those are true. You're gonna learn through the discovery process whether your initial assumptions are right, but that data is also gonna tell you where your appropriate pivots are. I've had teams go all the way to different, completely different market segments, 
I could share those stories if we had time, but literally from one medical segment to a drone, they were now doing battery powered uh, systems for drones all the way from heart implants and what it literally in a five week period and how did they do that were they jumping around making no they started with a core assumption they believed in tested it invalidated and what they learned from that validation or invalidation told them where to go next so i hope that's a part answer <laughs> that's a great example that's a a really answer. That's a great example. And I think that's helpful now as people are coming up with their ideas because yeah. we're gonna be catering to people in a for-profit track and a nonprofit track. And I know that mission statements are the underpinning things of a nonprofit and mission wander or mission stray can be a serious problem. Mm -hmm. So the importance of testing your idea upfront to make sure that you're staying faithful to that, you know, there's a lot of back end work that's going to need to happen. I think that nonprofits don't have the same level of agility to be able to switch necessarily. So um, I think that's an important thing for any of my nonprofit people out there to remember. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that. I wasn't aware you would have nonprofits. And that's a great point. Um, let's see. I have, you know, we work a lot through a very iterative process. There's a lot of mentoring. We do a lot of pitch workshops so that people start, you know, they start writing, they start riffing, and then they start getting more cohesive. There are pitch crits. And the before and afters tend to be really powerful with the students. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you've got an example of a venture that's sort of like the what not to wear that ended up turning around and being successful. Do you have like a, a good before and after of a team that might not have had a clear value prop in the beginning, but was able to pivot and succeed? I, I have lots of examples. Um, I was uh, thinking, as you're saying that, I was thinking about um, the ones that come to mind for some reason um, are mostly are mostly medical, um, mostly because we just finished up our i -Corps cohort, and this was a particular team. Um, you know, they, they went in, they had an adhesive, a medical bandage adhesive that uh, their problem they were trying to address was when you have an open wound or a burn victim, the actual redressing of those wounds tears the a part of the healed skin off when they're tears. So it's very painful. And they were trying to address the pain by developing an adhesive under this bandage that would break down under light, a certain type of UV light. And they went to nurses that were treating patients on a wound care floors and the nurses said, we don't care. They said, don't, don't you, aren't you worried about the pain? No, we don't care about the pain. This is 35 customer interviews in. They said, no, we don't care. And he said, what do you mean? Well, of course we care generally, but we have to pick one of those two bandages that are in the cabinet over there. We don't have any power or influence ability. So they completely had to pivot out of that segment. And moving from the wound care nurses, they went directly to the head wound care nurse. They, they said, well, how do we get different bandages into that cabinet? And she said, I don't care. And they're like, well, what do you mean you don't care? Well, of course I care that there's pain and that there should be alternative solutions, but we have to go with the ones that are approved cost-wise that go fit into that cabinet. Now there's 65 interviews in and they've been demoralized one step along the way. And at the end, uh, they are eventually, they said, well, who decides which ones go into those cabinets? And it was the, the, the um, reimbursement officer upstairs and they ended up with the reimbursement officers going, and he's desperate for anything, any solution that could resolve pain. He's willing to put a more expensive bandage into that cabinet if it's going to reduce the pain scores because he's reimbursed. The hospital system is reimbursed off of the pain scores. See, they didn't know that. They didn't understand that. They thought the total solution was just immediately addressing the pain that the patient had but only through up to 80 interviews now before they realize they have a bigger solution than they ever could imagine. And they actually had to go back into the laboratory and readdress the adhesive because he wanted it to be a stronger adhesive but break down quicker. And they were already re-engineering. So that team went on to start a, start a company. They raised several million dollars, got their new product issued. They're an FDA regulatory pathway now. And they would have never known if they'd have just simply built the product, tried to sell it to to wound care clinics, they would have never figured that out. I hope that's a little bit of an example. 
I'm just sort of trying to get over my personal squeamish factor to see the heart of the story, which was fantastic. (laughs) Sorry about that. No, not at all. Yeah, there's several others. The one I mentioned about the, there was a heart trans, not a transplant, but a heart pacemaker. They had come up with a way of a permanent battery, getting power off the flow of blood through the heart and transitioning that power back to the pacemaker. And the problem is, that's an interesting idea because you'd hate to get a pacemaker and 20 years later have to open up, do another open heart surgery to get it repaired, but, or get the battery replaced. But they found out that people don't get pacemakers till their late seventies and they don't live long enough for the batteries to go down. So, so there was no need for that. that However- is, That is a solution looking for a problem. <laughs> the same technology became a turbine to drive drones. And so you could repower we repower the batteries in a drone. They asked themselves, well, what other technologies have battery issues? And there were a number of them, and that was the one they focused on. So completely different pivot. Wow. So um, just a couple examples. So you spoke a little while ago about um, basically, oh, you know what? I, I know we're running out of time. I had one final question. No, I have sure. two questions, actually. Does, is that all right with you? No, it's fine by me. Sure, sure. Okay. Firstly, you were talking about how um, other partners, it's not just direct partners, it's just not consumers. Um, Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that are integrated into the success. You were saying it took 80 interviews to get to the guy upstairs who really had the answer. So, um, do you know, as as, as far as those partnerships are concerned, that's really important. But also, when you're creating your own team, partnerships mm-hmm. are incredibly important. Um, how does one go about identifying the right team and the right partners that can contribute to or are aligned with the value prop? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, there is a bit of a conundrum because um, a lot of times the value prop is delivered by the underlying technology, but the underlying technology is designed, developed, maintained and implemented by the team. And so to a large extent, the team is fundamental to the value proposition. So if, if what you have now is an idea, but no solution, I mean, you have an idea for how you would solve a particular problem, but you don't have the solution. You're, you're in a pretty good place in order to identify through the customer discovery activity, what is the unique and compelling problem and how does that manifest in terms of the pain? What does it limit the customer from doing? And what does, if it was resolved, what else could they be doing more effectively? And, and then that speaks very vividly to the clear features and attributes and, and deliverables that you have to have in that final product. So if you're one member of what needs to be a three member team, and you're doing this assessment and you come up with that clear articulation of what those compelling attributes are, you can then do a similar type of activity in, in backward fashion as to identify where are the key strengths? What do I need with respect to these? You know, I mentioned in the business, those key activities and key resources. Sometimes you need a key database in order to drive a pricing model. You need, or you need someone to build something like that. And if you can articulate that based on what you heard directly from the customer in terms of the clear and compelling features and attributes they would need in order to deliver that key value, you can articulate what the skill sets are that are going to be necessary in the the ultimate team. If you're not a team already going in, um, or better yet, even if you are, if you're open to part of the learning, part of the discovery being that the team has a gaping weakness in terms of its ability to deliver the value, that just, you ought to be honest with yourself. And so we've got to, we've got to cap that. We've got to fix it. And if, Again, if you're clear enough in what the customer needs, I think you'll be clear enough in understanding and isolating those skill sets. And from there, you know, uh, it just becomes a, a networking and marketing and recruiting type of activity that I think is, you know, we're all pretty familiar with. It's Excellent. not an easy, not an easy thing though. That, that, I'm usually dealing with teams who are fixed going in mm-hmm. and when they realize there's a gap, they look for an external partner and they're never open as many, maybe many of your teams will be open to reshaping the team, the fundamental team itself. That's a, that's a great concept. 
I think that's an important takeaway too. We've got a lot of students who might have a great idea who don't know who their teammates need to be, or we might have groups that are looking for that other person. So we're trying to facilitate the kind of networking that will enable people to have awareness of this, uh, have the self-awareness to be able to seek the right teammates and for mm. people in the community to have awareness of this opportunity so that people can find you know, those natural fits and those critical partners. Yeah, and sometimes it takes an intermediary like you to to facilitate that. That's challenging. Even if I am open to re hearing that I need help, finding that specific person or persons that, mm -hmm. that can be challenging. So yeah, we I we don't have that at Ohio State. So I may call call on you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> we you see know, 100 actually, ideas a year. <laughs> it's uh, it's worth mentioning that, you know, the the competition has primarily been in person. We pivoted sort of uh, as gracefully as we could in the spring for obvious reasons. We're doing the entire program virtually this year. Um, most of the MIT students are off campus. It's a year-ish long program, so we mm -hmm. want to make it fair and equitable for everybody. So to that end, um, students anywhere can be part of teams. Um, hmm. Teams just have to have one MIT student. So if you have any students who might be interested in this, we certainly can try to broker something to get, you know, get this on the map because at least where Zoom is concerned, there's like the sky's the limit on these teams right. and partnerships. So and uh, what's the what's the deadline for when the team has to be finalized? That's a great question. The applications are due the first week of February, but I think that as the projects and programs sort of go through various iterations. Um, you know, I think we should have a great idea of what teams are roughly by the first week of February, but there could still be a little bit, you know, through one-on-one -on -one mentorship, students might figure out that, oh, we really need another person here. So in order to maximize success, we are probably open to the idea of, you know, adding people as needed. Okay. Great. No, I definitely would have people interested. So if you Perfect. Can stay, oh, let's, con stay connected, let me know. <laughs> let's do that. Um, Theo, did you have one final question before we wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Camp, I think you started to reference this in your, uh, your spoilers, but I think if you have any, uh, if you could share one kind of pearl of wisdom or one key takeaway for teams in this competition, I think that would be really helpful for the mm -hmm. teams here and uh, those watching asynchronously. Yeah, no, thanks. That's a great way to wrap up. You know, I, in thinking about that, there's, um, so, there's so many pieces that go together. Um, and I, I don't know if you, you guys put more weight on the final presentation in terms of determining winners uh, or not, or if it's just kind of a cumulative effect as, as teams move through the, the program. But um, the, the ability to tell an effective story and when I again heard that it's about a five minute presentation with the five minutes of q and I wanted to emphasize that if a team's not able to tell the story uh, in a compelling convincing fashion in the five minutes they better be able to answer the questions <laughs> in a compelling convincing way because they're going to get the key questions that the reviewers judges whatever they're called are going to be listening for um, however, my advice would be to, um, by getting familiar and, and testing very clearly and honestly, openly questioning and challenging your own understanding and underlying assumptions, you're going to have a much more compelling way to tell the key considerations, uh, you know, whatever that, whether it be market that differentiates your opportunity or it's the compelling solution or whether it be just what kind of economic or social or uh, human impact you're able to have, you, you need to isolate and be able to articulate what that really moving moment, that moving element is. Um, it's not enough to just, you know, dotting I's and crossing T's. There's probably so many good ideas in this competition. The team that can get that idea across in a believable, realistic way, and the best believability is that you've, if you've either done it or if you haven't done it, you have, have connected directly with those end users and partners so that they'll tell you, those who have done it can tell you that this is doable, this is believable. In other words, it's, it's making it real, as real as possible. And the moment you have to say, I think, I believe, you, know, you realize that's a, that's a compelling gap. That's an area of challenge that you're going to have. 
making it real, making it concise, hitting the critical elements that make your opportunity differentiated from the others and uh, having, and because now you've done that, you'll have so much more confidence in, in, in terms of how you tell that story. It doesn't sound like one thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best possible answer. Now, anybody who is here for our kickoff conference and keynote and anybody who's watching who, you know, will watch this, who saw that first event, it all comes down to storytelling. There are mm. so many entrepreneurship innovation initiatives at the Institute and everybody has their own sort of value added. And apart from being arts driven, the thing that people come here and the big takeaway is storytelling. Yeah. Um, it's, it's sort of the underpinning of the entire operation. So uh, I promise we didn't feed Dr. Camp that answer. It just <laughs> fits so perfectly within the theme of being successful with helping to launch your venture. So <laughs> that Absolutely. couldn't have been better. <laughs> and All with right. the cathedral background, I got to say, amen. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, hey, if I can be at the final event, I'd love to see some of those oh, great stories. That absolutely. Are we will definitely guest, be in touch. That listen. would be fantastic. Um, yeah. So if any of the three of you stalwart soldiers here have any questions, let me know. Um, we can also forward things on to Dr. Camp. So, you know, if that is it for everybody, then um, I'm just going to thank Dr. Camp for his time. It was fantastic having you here. We really appreciate this. And it was so engaging, especially even for Zoom. You know, it was, <laughs> it was wonderful. We can't thank you enough. Well, glad to be with you. Thanks again. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you so much.